I hit record. So welcome everybody to the Northern Kentucky Accountability Group. This is the Kenton County Libraries Job Search Support Group for professional level people that are in transition or anyone wanting to change careers. We ask today that you please keep your microphone muted, but that you keep your video on. If you're not on a treadmill or an elliptical, that is, and um, or don't have little kids running around in the background and you're comfortable, it's just our way of our coaches and our staff having the opportunity to get to know you. So that's all good. Uh, the ticket to the entry to this group is a Kenton County Public Library card. If you don't have one, most of you can get one for free. If you live within about 60 miles radius of the library, if you're from really out of state, you pay a one-time fee of $50, but then you have a card with us for life. If you need help with getting one, uh, either Michaela Brongs or Don Shoemaker on my team would be happy to help you with that as well. And also, Michaela Brungs is joining us today. Michaela can say hi so you can see her face. Good morning, um, everyone. Available. If you have any questions about any of our resources or how to get involved, you're welcome to reach out to Michaela. Um, we also have Nancy Knopf, uh, Gary McGuire, and Don Shoemaker. Don will be joining us at the roundtable. There are career change navigators that you can meet with in our buildings or via Zoom for helping your job search or any of KCPL's resources. We also have several of our wonderful volunteer coaches who are dedicated to helping people from the NKYG find jobs. And they can help you with reviewing your resumes, kind of talking through where you are in your job search, doing practice interviews with you to get you ready. So they're all wonderful. And their emails are always noted at the end of my weekly email or Michaela can send them to you if you need them. So I know um, both Steve O'Neill, who has a background in engineering is with us this morning, and Marty Page, who is actually a career coach with Promac, is also here with us this morning. You guys know what I always say, our goal is for you to become a student of the job search process. And the sooner that you accept that this is a process and there is a ton to know, about looking for a job today, the more, the sooner you're going to have success. Once you learn all the skills that we're going to teach you, you will never have to fear looking for a job again, because if you give, get moved around like um, a pawn on the chessboard by somebody higher up or some organization higher up than you, you'll know exactly what to do in the future. Um, good news, there are tons of job openings showing up out there, tons. We're amazed. Um, even the lower level jobs, we're predicting the next thing we're gonna start seeing in our area is signs on like Dairy Queen or McDonald's that close because we don't have enough help. So we know we have a severe labor shortage with entry level jobs, but we're seeing a lot of the bigger jobs, the professional level jobs become available as well. One thing I wanted to remind everybody of, um, and this has really resonated through the pandemic. We had a lot of people who lost their jobs, who had service type oriented jobs, who took the time to basically start their own consulting business so that they could do contract work for employers as well they were looking for other jobs. Several of those people that did that, it was like the company got to kick the tires with them and as things got better in the economy and things have changed, they have turned those contract positions into full-time jobs. That being said, we have a great class. It's gonna be our first back in the building class coming up next Tuesday, April 6th with Patricia Bourne of CEO Resources. Um, it's going to be a class on how to start your own consulting business um, we can only have 10 people in the class. So if you're interested in it, please sign up right away to do that with Patricia. Everyone will be seated at their own individual table. Um, so you don't have to worry about that in a great big room. So it should be very safe as far as the pandemic goes. Um, uh, since we have Dr. Figueroa this morning, um, and he is, we're very 
happy to have him with us. I didn't wanna to take too much time on sharing other details with you about a lot of our upcoming classes, just that one. Um, but Michaela will be po posting links to all of our upcoming classes in the chat for you, um, including open job searching uh, with Gary McGuire. You don't have to actually register for that. That comes up on Saturday. Uh, Pam Baker is doing a class on using Gail courses and Learning Express tomorrow. Maria Reynolds is doing a resume workshop for us on Monday. So lots of great things coming up there. And I'll touch base on those a little bit towards the end. So Dr. Figueroa, are you out there? I think he is. I, just I am indeed. Great, good morning. How are you today? Oh, good morning. We're doing okay. We're doing all right with this uh, weather shifting. It's something to get used to in Kentucky and Louisiana. Once it gets warm, it stays warm. It stays warm. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> it's I been know. five years. So there I am. I know it's it's tough. Well, we're very happy to have you join us. Um, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to hear Dr. Figueroa speak, he is amazing. I've had the good fortune to be a part of the Northern Kentucky community. And so Gateway Community and Technical College has all its locations. I've been exposed to his wonderful staff that work there. We are the library of choice for Gateway students. So we're always helping students that come out of the school. And Dr. Figueroa sits on the Northern Kentucky Workforce Investment Board. So he's instrumental in changing our workforce for the future and helping our economy grow. Just so you know um, some key details about him, Dr. Figueroa is the president of Gateway Community and Technical College in Northern Kentucky. He has served students in higher education for more than 25 years from classroom instruction to all aspects of administration. In his time at Gateway, he has been an advocate for key initiatives in the region, particularly focused on workforce development and diversity, inclusion, and equity. He has championed Gateway's role in, a str in strong kindergarten through grade 12 partnerships, as well as relationships with other local colleges and universities. A native of New Orleans, Dr. Figueroa appreciates a good coffee au lat and a great rock and roll riff. He enjoys playing guitar, guitar and recording and publishing his own music. I didn't know you did that. That's I amazing. did. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, Dr. Figueroa and his wife, Debbie, who is a professional artist, a lot of talent in the family, uh, share four wonderful children, three grandchildren, I'm jealous, and two fur babies. Everybody knows I have two daughters and two grand puppies, no grandchildren. So um, Dr. Figueroa holds a PhD and a Master of Arts in Education from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and a Bachelor of Arts in English from Loyola, Loyola University in New Orleans. So kind of says it all, right? <laughs> so, okay. John, I hope not. Uh, He's so, going to talk a lot about shifting gears, changing careers. So I asked him to join us and speak. So I'll let you take it away and you're officially co-host now too. Okay, very okay. good. Yeah, I just um, want to thank you guys for, for, you know, just your own personal journeys. And, um, and I want to thank Natalie uh, for inviting me to kind of share some thoughts that I've had on my journey um, and things that I've learned about the, the world of work and the, the ecosystems that we're living in and the changes and just provide you some thoughts and ideas. I mean, uh, I'll have some practical suggestions um, that kind of come out of that thinking, but I, I've, um, you know, as I've moved from roles from faculty to administration and then from, you know, um, mid-level management to upper management to leadership positions, um, there's been quite a lot that has um, shifted my thinking um, through, the, through the periods. And so I'll be sharing some of that as well. But um, the, the main thing I think I wanna just uh, start with is just the, the fact that you're here on a Kenton County Public Library sponsored activity. And um, that, you know, we, we when I grew up, you know, I always thought of the library as the library card, right? And you go and you check out a book and it'd be wonderful. And, and it was a place for learning and 
Uh, and then later, you know, people became, you know, was the internet got more involved? It was about doing research of this kind of other thing. And mostly it was all about genealogy, right? Where have I come from? Who am I? And, and you know, that seems to be the perennial question for all of us. Um, but in the recent years, I just want to thank, you know, Kenton County Libraries, Natalie, and the work with uh, Dave is to really rethink what a library is. And, you know, as a community, as a community service and as a community spirit. And that's something that I think is really all part of this, this, this rapidly evolving concept that we have about the assets of a community and particularly about its people, about our people. And, you know, we've, we've come up through an industrial age, an industrial age that has um, had the thought of replaceable parts has had the thought of um, you know, widgets that never change. And all you do is take the widget out of the machine and put another widget in there, but you're always looking for the same widget. And you know, in the last probably 20, 30, 40 years, we've become more and more aware of the fact that we're not talking about widgets anymore in terms of the world of work. And we're not talking about widgets anymore in terms of people that, that we are looking at a very different workforce and a different place for the workforce to express itself. And so I'm going to kind of give you some thoughts about mindsets, really, because I, I think that mindsets are, are the key component to start, you know, really exploring what is it that is your journey and to see it as a journey. Because um, a lot of times, again, and I'll go more to this in a little bit, um, the mechanical mindset, the industrial mindset is once you're tossed, you're done. And if you can't fit that hole, right, if you can't fit that square, then what good are you really? And uh, some of you have probably seen the, um, there's a cartoon that, that goes through a periodic thing on Facebook, but it's got like a, a, a monkey, a dog, a cow, uh, and, a, uh, and a sloth. And, you know, there's a banana up a tree and it says, okay, everybody's got an equal shot. Right. And it's like, no. Uh, and when we look at education that way, or we look at workforce that way, then we start doing this filtering thing and we're sifting people. And what we found, of course, in, in terms of turnover rates and, and before the pandemic, I just want to give you a sense that in Cincinnati, the, the turnover rate in Cincinnati was 400 percent a year. 400 percent. And it wasn't much better in northern Kentucky. That's amazing. So, so this cycling and recycling, it's like there's, some, there's something amiss. And so I'm going to explore some of that with you and then hopefully give you some, I want to give you some things that you can, that you can do to kind of uh, work through the journey because there's, there's some icky parts to this journey and I've been through it too. Um, but so, so mindsets, that's a really important thing. First of all, what is your mindset, right? Because mindsets can create pathways it can say, you know what, I don't have a job dollars per hour exchange with an employer, but I do have value in terms of what I could consult or provide, you know, information or, um, you know, a service on a contract. And then if there's perceived value in that contract, that can be converted to something else. Um, I, I, I've known folks who, when they were, de, you know, de-jobbed, um, or ran to, you know, dissatisfaction in their career, they usually was one key question. Can you see yourself doing something? Can you see yourself doing something else? And I have experienced individuals that have made with a PhD in clinical psychology, my best friend from high school, went into five years of weirdness, getting hired at firms and getting fired, and, and people been bezzling and getting you know shut down and all of this. And after five years, he was exhausted. He said, Fernando, I can't do this anymore. I, I gotta do something. And I said, Well, what else could you do? What else do you think you could do? He said, I don't think I can do anything else. This is a guy with a PhD in clinical psychology, right? <laughs> understanding resilience, understanding, you know, mindsets and mind maps and all this way, the way we, we create barriers for ourselves through our thoughts. And he was trapped in that PhD. He was trapped in that, that, that credential that said, you are a PhD in clinical psychology, therefore you must be a clinical psychologist. And that's insane. And that's why I think, you know, sometimes entrepreneurs are, 
there's a lot of entrepreneurial thinking of individuals who don't finish school, right? Who don't finish a credential. I don't recommend that. I'm, a, I'm the president of a proud president of a credential awarding institution that provides value and re relevant and you know, engaging curriculum that serves our region. Um, but if the mindset of a Elon Musk, right? And we always point to the big ones, right? We, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they never finished their PhD, they never finished their master's degree, they never finished their high school diploma, whatever. Um, but usually that, they, and, and there's something beyond just not having the credential, that's the thing. It's that they've got a strong vision and passion of who they are and what they want to accomplish. And so when you're thinking about this search, when you're thinking about your journey and as it evolves, and this is really I found to all parts of my life is like, what's the mindset? What's the mind map that you created for yourself? Where are there doors that open and where are there doors that are closed? Um, where are there pathways that are obvious and where are there pathways that are, you know, like in the road, not taken, there are brambles all over it. And you're not sure about, you know, whether you're going to peek through that or if you got a machete to cut through it. Um, but, you know, it, it's like to be aware of that inside of yourself helps you deal with one of the big things that's emerged in the last 10 years that I've heard a lot about is this imposter syndrome thing, which is nuts, right? Because again, you're looking at yourself and you're saying, okay, I've got to fit a widget. And if you don't feel like you fit that widget or that shape that's supposedly been prefigured for you to, to perform in, then of course you're going to feel about the, the, the imposter settlement because you didn't do it. It was somebody else's definition for the position that in reality doesn't have anything to do with you. If you don't come in and imbue it with you and your sense of value and your vision for community and your vision for what the value of work is, then all you're doing is following rote memorization, going through a series of tasks, and the more high pressure it is, the more high pressure it is, the worse it is for you. And you end up with stress and working 70 to 80 to 90 to 100 hours a week, but you never feel like you get ahead because the system is beyond you. And so then there's a sense of, of learned helplessness and I don't really belong and I'm this or that. And, and, and so I want to pivot a little bit to one of my favorite writers is a guy named Joseph Campbell. And he was made famous by Bill Moyers in a series called The Power of Myth. Highly encouraged looking at it. And, and one of the things that, that I took away from Joseph Campbell was beyond the fact that the place that scares you is exactly where your treasure is, which is a nice phrase to remember, <laughs> maybe tack it up on your wall. Usually that's the case. The door that you've closed off to yourself is likely the one that, that really has uh, great value for you. But, but the other one is that the unexamined myth, not the unexamined life, like Socrates said, but the unexamined myth is the one that owns you. And we all live our lives with these scripts that we're given as a child, by our family, by our community. You can't, you can't, you're good at, you're not good at. You're desirable, you're not desirable, you're friendly, you're not. All of these things in the scripts and, and you know, my case, uh, you know, I became very much aware of what it means to be a Figueroa. And I'm sure many of you have that family, you know, dynamic of this is what Figueroas do and Figueroas always. And so all of these mythologies, and especially as they're tied to work, because with work comes the idea of being able to support yourself and sustain yourself and that it's, it's your value in some way, shape or form by an external entity. And therefore, if you don't have a job, you are not valued. There's all of this stuff that's in play and that plays on us and preys on us until we unearth them, until we take the time to really understand that these are the energies that are bumping up against us like a shark if we're swimming in the ocean. It's like, it's just bumping and saying, remember me, remember me, remember me. And so to take the time you know, and this is not mumbo jumbo, all this other stuff. I mean, it, it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation as the new technology, because this, there's more and more research that's showing that being mindful about your choices, being mindful about your life, being mindful about what you want to, what do you want to create in terms of what's important to you? You know, 
the, the family that you desire to create. Is it really your desire or is it a mythology of what you're supposed to create? The kind of job you're working in, is it because you were always told you were good in math so you should be an accountant? You know, I, I know a lot of folks that are accountants today because when they were five years old, someone said, you're good at math, you ought to be an accountant. And they said, oh, I don't know what else to do, so there, let's go. Um, and then it's somebody else telling them what to do. So there's been some really good research. I'm gonna provide uh, one source with two books that I highly recommend. Uh, and you can, do, you can do this on the cheap on YouTube, and take a look, his name is Daniel Pink, P-I-N-K, like the color. And he said two works, uh, two books that have transformed the way I think a lot about a lot of this stuff. The first um, was A Whole New Mind and the second was Drive. I'm gonna start with Drive because it was focused on motivation and what is it that motivates people in the world of work? And he, he pointed to a few things in that book, um, but he starts with, the idea of um, the candle problem. And some of you have seen this, you can look it up online. Basically you get a box with tax with um, box with tax and a candle. And the idea is you have to affix the candle to a wall, right? Without it dripping any wax on the floor. And so people, kind of go through this process and go through this process. And they first think, okay, well, you know, we'll melt the bottom of the wax and we'll put it on the wall. Well, that doesn't work. And then, you know, we'll try 19 different things. And then finally you kind of stumble on the fact that the box isn't for the tax, right? That the tax into the wall with the box, with the candle being held into the box is one solution to the problem. It's not the only solution, but it is, it is the one that, seems to be the most workable. So the, the candle problem is about reseeing the field, right? Rethinking what are the assets available. If you see the box as holding the tax and that's all you see, then you'll never solve the problem because you're locked into this idea that a box hold this, holds the tax. But if you can look beyond and, and allow the sense that, that dead ends are not dead ends, they are simply as far as that vision or that myth can take you, but they do not define all of the possibilities there. And so then there's a real opportunity in that moment of being able to say, okay, what is it that drives people past their candle problem? And what Daniel Pink has argued through, through the research that he identifies in the book um, is that people are internally motivated. Primarily, it's kind of like the research you've seen also on the internet about, you know, what does it take to be happy? How much money do you have to earn to be happy? And at which point does it become superfluous? And, you know, you can argue it or not, but, you know, about $75,000 gross a year should be enough, right? If happiness, quote unquote, you know, the happiness satisfaction, I take it, can take care of my bills, I can take care of my family. You know, now economics is changing and it probably is now closer to 100, unfortunately, uh, with inflation and all that stuff. But, but what, we're, what, we're, what we seem to be thinking is that it, more is not better. More is not happier. It's not, you know, 15 stakes as opposed to 12, right? It, it, there does seem to be this sense of at some point it becomes an internal journey and an internal question of, are you authentic? Are you capable of answering the imposter question with the fact that I'm here? as I am with my talents and abilities, but you got to know what those talents and abilities are. And so the research that he refers to, and I've kept this and I use this every day in my life when I think about people I'm working with and the teams that I'm working on is that people want three things. Autonomy, this should sound very familiar. Autonomy, the, the time and ability to develop mastery in something and purpose. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose, AMP. All right, that's how I remember it. And so this is something I've recognized in myself and understood the fact that I don't like, for me personally, I don't wanna to be told what to do. That's kind of the reason why, you know, moving up the chain became more important to me because at that point, now you always have, you know, as Bob Dylan says, you always serve somebody. And ultimately I wanted to serve a community. 
And that's you know much more complex, it's much more diverse, and it's much more playful because there's no answer. That was me. But mastery, you know, uh, Natalie mentioned I, I play and produce music. And one of the most exciting things for me about playing music is working with the software and knowing that I'm not a master of it, but I don't have anybody saying, when's the next song coming out? When's the next song coming out? I get to play with that and identify and say, take time and let myself listen to things and work with things and be surprised and try crazy stuff without consequences in that arena, which frees me then to play a little bit more in my professional arena where there are accountabilities. And I can say, well, wait a second, if this crazy idea that inverting this in music worked would be inverting maybe what the college does here or how we interact with students or how do we work, interact with the workforce partner? So it keeps everything kind of moving for me. And then of course, the ultimate purpose is what, it, what do you want the work to be done? What do you, what do you want the work, right? Um, the way that Joseph Campbell talks about it in, in The Power of Myth is why do you need the grail, right? In the Arthurian legend, right? It's all, the, one of the legends has to be the pursuit of the grail. And of course we learned about that in Indiana Jones and the, in the, you know, the, uh, the third movie, right? The good one with Sean Connery. And, uh, you know, why do you want the grail? Why do you want the job? Why do you want the role? And answering that question to yourself and really getting into it, because I know, I know folks that have pursued presidencies and they hate it because they didn't want to work for a board. Okay. Right, but you knew that was going in. Well, but I wanted the title. It's like the title doesn't mean squat. It never does. Anybody and everybody can be fired. Billionaires can lose billions in a day in this world. And so, you know, I, I, I take heart from the fact that if I take the time, right? If we take the time to understand our time, what are we looking for in terms of our time? What are we looking for in terms of mastery? What do we want to be, you know, know ourselves for? So the imposter syndrome it never has a role in our conversations. And then our purpose is the thing that's going to drive us through those hedges. That when the hedges pop up, it's like, but I want this. Right now, one of my grails, one of the things that I'm looking to do is get a community dashboard for Northern Kentucky that identifies key metrics that will identify we are, we are going green, we're going yellow, we're going red in terms of overall community vibrancy. And I'm, I, you know, there are places where people are excited about it, people, you know, people are deaf to it, but it's like, it, there, and there's no prepackaged thing. And that's, that's gonna be the next thing I'm gonna talk about in the whole new mind is there's no prepackaged answer to any of this. It's constantly going through it. And the purpose is what drives me. And I know in each of your lives, there is a purpose. There's a reason why you wanna have the grail, whether it's the job or the series of jobs, or if it's an entrepreneurial thing, you're gonna need a purpose to gut through a lot of the stuff that's gonna be needed. You're gonna to have to learn a lot. You're gonna to have to be uncomfortable. And if you remember when you were a kid, a lot of times being uncomfortable was a pretty good indication you were gonna get it done. You struck out at play. I don't know about you, but when I struck out first time in softball, I was like, oh, that ain't going to happen again. <laughs> and of course it did. <laughs> but it kept on coming back and coming back because it was important to me. And, I, and, and to, to look at that in, in yourself, I, I, I share that as, a, as advice, as an example, and as encouragement that that thing inside of you, and there are multiple things inside of you, that are looking for expression, that are consciously important to you and right now that are unconsciously important to you. As you key into that and key into your understanding of that, then it'll help guide your next choices. It'll help guide the energy with which you bring into an interview that when people see you, you will be switched on, you will be lit up. It won't be simply, I am here to look for a job. Because frankly, before the before COVID, we had a lot of, I am here to look for a job. And people were working two and three jobs because of the economic situations that we have here in the United States. 
in the world really, but in the United States is what I know and Northern Kentucky is that, you know, having two or three jobs at quote minimum wage ain't cutting it for a sustainable wage. And that's just reality. And especially when it comes to uh, single parents of color, particularly single women of color and single women Caucasian, there is a lot of work to be done in our community. And so thinking about your talents, your work, we've come up in a whole new mind. Daniel Pink uh, really opened up my mind in, in the sense that we're coming out of an industrial age and coming into a technology age or software age, or just, it's a much more playful age, scary in a lot of ways too, because in the industrial age, there was an answer. You had a product, you had an ecosystem that was clearly defined with widgets and gears and everything else, and it was all very simple. And so math, reading, writing, and arithmetic were the thing, because they always came out with, there was good penmanship, right? There was the ability to comprehend language, and you know, arithmetic was about running the empire, right? The British Empire valued reading and writing and arithmetic and we're still focused on that even though the whole world has completely changed from the british times of the british empire now he he talks about and i encourage you to write this down and look it up and 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 again encourage the book or listen to his ted talk story is going to become an increasingly important skill right brain skills right the ability to design and look at design and see how all the pieces and parts fit together for the ultimate goal and product. A lot of entrepreneurs are making a lot of money on design. Some doing wholesale design changes, some doing minor. If you think about Elon Musk, it's all about design. If you think about Facebook, it's all about design. How do we interact in a world where I want to interact with somebody in China? Well, it's, we got to design the network to do that. Networks are all about the, the game of design. Synthesis, synthesis, and symphony. And there's that famous line in uh, the, the Steve Jobs movies, like, they play the instruments, I conduct the symphony. That was how Steve Jobs saw his, his work. Um, and empathy and meaning. And notice, none of this is about getting the right answer. These are right brain skills. These are artistic, what we used to call artistic skills. These are skills that are able to see a bigger picture. It doesn't mean that we've left math behind. It doesn't mean that we've left, you know, left brain behind. And one of the challenges with right now, on top of everything else, is the fact we are in the collision of industrial with technology. And we haven't yet made the full turn. And so right now we're kind of in the middle. It's like people still want you to have widget skills. Fine. Understand what they're asking for. Understand what you're providing. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But they don't own you. And they never will if you don't let them. And then this idea that coming to the world then from that perspective, now think about it. This is a very different perspective. When you look at problems, from a reading, writing, arithmetic, then you look at how the British Empire deal with, with India and Pakistan. And they just said, draw a line. There, you got two countries, right? Did this in Africa? Did this in Ireland? And they did. They just drew lines. Boom. Problem solved. And then that leads to decades of violence and bloodshed. Again, not paying attention to people. It's all about the grid. What today is in front of us are communities that are suffering, companies that are struggling. 70% before COVID, 70% at least of all workers that were identifying themselves on a happiness scale said they hated their jobs. And here you are in the pursuit of a job and a career and purpose. And yet, your peers, right, individuals in the workforce have been feeling these pressures, this, you know, industrial technology, um, what, uh, and this is, this one is a, a, a larger work, it's kind of a weirder thing, I've really enjoyed, it's called 
third wave. The author is Alvin Toffler, T-O-F-F-L-E-R, Alvin Toffler, The Third Wave. It was written in 1980, you will see. It was a futurist writing in 1980. Uh, there, are, there are some things, obviously, that were missed, um, but there are amazing things in terms of the shift uh, from just all, from industrial to technology and all the different things. And he says, the major skill that we need to learn now is not reading, writing, arithmetic. His is the ability to learn and relearn. Unlearn, relearn, unlearn, relearn. Over and over and over again, because there's not an answer anymore. We're not looking for, you know, we're not able to do answers. There is no fix to community. There are people who are seeing what, it, what uh, I think the term that I wanted to use was um, problems are solved as purposeful puzzles. <laughs> so that's very alliterative, but you know, problems are solved as purposeful puzzles. If we approach our community and say, what, is, what needs to be done? What's the work that needs to be done? Certainly jobs and getting a job and, and having you know, salary and benefits um, and, and working internally you know, with those models and you, know, you can have a job, but the job is not you, right? And you can work your way through this process and it be a journey that you're on rather than a journey you're put on. Um, think of job descriptions. Now I can tell you I'm working with employers Job descriptions are not authentic. They are a listing of desired traits and or have been outdated and have not been reviewed in 10, 15, 20 years. And we sometimes talk to employers and we say, okay, what are the competencies you're looking for? What do you want people to be able to do? And usually they don't find it in their job descriptions. So that's... And again, something else to think about as you go through this is it's not that the job, if you're trying to fit a job description and put it around you and say, okay, I fit the job description, then understand the fact that A, the job description is probably obsolete. B, it's certainly not static and everything will change the day after you get hired. And it, there's this question of flexibility and mobility, flexibility and mobility. And what is it that you see are your competencies? You know, we're, when we're growing up, it's like we're looking for other people. Oh, tell me what I'm good at. Tell me what I'm good at. And we don't spend nearly enough time saying, you know what I'm really good at? I really love this. You know, when I discovered, I, I came to guitar playing really late in life. I was 17 years old before I picked up a guitar, but I fell in love with the guitar when I was four years old. I saw an old beat up, you know, it was, came out of a, a, a Mexican tourist store. My dad bought it and I was big into uh, Wiley Coyote at the time. I had a little sticker, I put it on that thing and I just, and it, it was, it, there were, it was not a guitar, it was a toy, right? But for me, it was, it was real and I love that thing. And I was in love with the guitar for many, many years before I ever got through the brambles and said, I could do this. And it was a beat up acoustic guitar that my cousin in Puerto Rico didn't want. It was like a $5 thing. And it was like, okay. I mean, I never thought, okay, you could actually buy one, right? Actually talk my dad into buying it for me, you know, at the time. But, but uh, I brought it on the plane back to, back to New Orleans. And this is how smart I was. I put fish wire on it. So I could like pretend to strum it or pretend to play. Didn't yet see myself as being able to play, but I love the guitar and I love the whole idea of it and everything else. But it never struck me until my dad walked, walked in one day and said, kid, we're going to a guitar store. We're going to get strings for that thing. And I got strings for it. And then I tried to tune it myself and I nearly killed the thing because I, I thought it was E-A-D-B-G. I, it, it wasn't the way a guitar is tuned. I thought I tried to tune like a piano. Finally, took me again back there. He said, "Get your lessons," and uh, and I can tell you, it was it was all of a sudden. I had friends who wanted to learn "Stairway to Heaven" because why not, right? I want to learn the latest "Stairway to Heaven" because that's the coolest thing on the planet. 
And if you go to guitar stores now, that's, that is verboten. You, nobody gets to play the intro to Stairway to Heaven. Um, but, but it was, I wanted to learn how the ding dong thing worked. And frankly, because I, I felt I had something to say and I wanted to be able to say it through this tool. And when I became a professor or teacher or instructor, whatever you want to call it, that was another thing. It's like, you know, do you really love English? You know, it, it was a puzzle. It was a way for people to connect. I love reading stories because it, it taught me how to think about people, right? And how people interact and, and perceptions and conceptions. And, and then it was like, okay, what are you going to do with an English degree? Well, there I was, right? What are you going to teach? Because you can't do anything else with an English degree, which is wrong. Uh, but that was the path that I took. But again, they became tools for me as I grew as a person and came to care about certain, certain concepts and ideas and perceptions about, you know, what kept me in the profession was, was one moment. I was, in a, I was teaching a poetry class and it was like uh, in the middle of a, uh, discussing a, uh, one of the poems and interpreting the poems. And of course the old idea that people think there's an answer to the poem. It's like, no, it's an exploration and whatever. But I had a student go all of a sudden in the middle of this conversation go, oh, I get it. And we, okay, so we thought we were talking about this poem. It's like, no, two weeks ago, there was this, I finally get it. And it, 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 and in my years of experience in the in education field and in workforce, the minute a person lights up, and it's like, I get it. Get out of the way. Just get out of the way, right? You want to know the, mo the most motivated people in education that I've ever seen? Single moms, get out of the way. They have purpose. And usually it's that child. And he set an example, want to be able to be, uh, be able to work and learn with this child. And I want to build a better life. And so our KCTCS model is build a better life. And that's, you know, for me, that's, that's, that's it. And so what is, what is that? Why do you need the grail? Why do you want the grail? Why are you going to, because as Jim Carrey says, the great philosopher and comedian, Jim Carrey, you're going to take crap no matter what. You're going to fail no matter what. Do you want to fail for something that is defined by somebody else? That can be given or taken by somebody else? Or are you going to be in the journey? Are you going to be in the game? I mean, there's a reason why Rocky matters. There's a reason why Luke Skywalker matters. There's a reason why, you know, the, the, the great, you know, and, and, and our stories are developing and evolving to include more folks and more types of stories. Because that's, that seems to be the journey that we're on, is helping and, and working with each other. And Ram Das, uh, another wonderful uh, philosopher and Buddhist, you know, says we're walking each other home. We're walking each other home. And so the work that's disguised as a job is about helping us walk each other home. And that's a very different way to think about it. And I, and I know some of you are going, oh my God, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, lemma, lemma, lemma. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it is, I have found it to be true because there are days when the wind is out of my sails and I have seen people dragging and yet they come back the next day and they're like, okay, because this matters, it's important. And it's important not to meet the, the bottom line of the corporate or the stockholder, right? It's because I have become a shareholder in the vision of whatever this is. And it's balancing that out. You know, it may be working a dollars per hour exchange for a while, and maybe that's, that's your thing. And that's fantastic, whatever it is, but at least it's become something that you feel connected to, that empathy thing. And you're able to connect to other people and learning to tell your story and to, to, to understand your competencies. What is it that you bring to the equation that you're not just fitting, right? Some sort of description map or matrix to say, okay, you gotta fit like this if you wanna be part of us. You know, I, and looking for the right, you know, 
I could go on and on about the right fit and, and all this other stuff and culture. And, and there's a lot to learn in all of that. But frankly, culture is not something that is. Culture is something that is every day an exchange between individuals. It is not in a strategic plan. It is not on a freaking map. It's not, pardon my, I, just, I, mean, I get really passionate about this stuff because we're, we're, we're first and last. I'll, I'll be straight with you. Okay, I'll be straight with you. My dad's dying. My, my hero, okay? He's probably in his final hours of life right now. And because of him and taking me to that guitar shop, now he wanted me to learn classical. That never happened. I learned Dylan. Uh, but, but, so we, 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 never, we didn't always agree, but he saw what it was there. There was something there. And he added some energy to that. And... And I have a son who plays jazz and some days it's like, dad, you know, sometimes the gig works and sometimes it doesn't. It's like, I know kid, but the jazz matters, right? It's not because being clever. It's because there's something in the moment. There's something in the music. There's something in the interaction that lights him up. And that's important to him. You know, if you've seen the movie soul, uh, highly recommend it. Pixar movie. That's, that's a, again, the flow, whatever it is. And, and it's, it's not an answer and it's not a job. It's like, you are the grail, straight up. You are the grail. You are that which is being offered. And if there are places that can't see that, then that's an internal journey of, okay, am I to be seen here or not? But if you know that you are the, that you're the competency, you're the talent, you're bringing something of value into every situation, then it doesn't, you know, the evaluation cycle is another thing that drives me nuts. This whole idea that you're going to judge or grade or be graded. Um, it, frankly, it works in a writing, re reading, writing, arithmetic world, but it doesn't work in a story empathy world or a synthesis world or a symphony world. Right. We, we, we need to come together in the sense of what is, what is our best in this journey? Because the work is hard. And it requires an authentic evaluation of our place and role in it. You know, a lot of the social unrest in the last year has uh, caused me to really think about my interactions around diversity, equity, inclusion, and, you know, being authentic in, in the, the notion um, in one of the Unitarian Eight Principles, uh, the first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. And I start there because that's, that's my zero, zero. That's my zero, zero. Um, and I take very seriously to myself that um, that's why I want the grail. And that's the journey that I've, I've set for myself. And it ain't always fun. There are days and then there are days. And then you get a letter or a note from someone whose life you touched peripherally because you're president of a college. And it's like, proud to have you as my president because my life is so much better because of Gateway. And it's like, that's the team, man. That's a, that's a team of folks that's come together. And you're being part of that authentic journey of Northern Kentucky because Northern Kentucky's got some work to do. And uh, we've got challenges and we've got problems that are going to be solved, but, uh, you know, it's purposeful puzzles. Um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with one other thought in terms of a very practical thing. Um, when I applied for the presidency of Gateway, I sent my resume draft to a friend of mine who had been president of the university for a couple of years. And she said, Fernando, this is really great. So you're, you're applying for a provost job, which is the chief academic officer of an institution. It's the job I had. She's like, Yeah. Uh, no, I'm buying for a presidency. It's like, this isn't a president's uh, resume. This is a provost resume. So thinking about how you present your talents and competencies, taking some time to understand what is it that lights you up? Um, what Color Is Your Parachute is a great book. It's an old series, but it's still a wonderful book and an exploration, a way to help you guide. Uh, Zen and the Art of Making a Living is another fantastic book if you're kind of more in the out there kind of way of thinking. Um, because again, it focuses on that purpose element and thinking about it differently. But what are, what, are your, what are your competencies? And then 
yeah, what you've done in the past is important, but not nearly as important as how you're going to demonstrate what you want to do and what you can do in the new potential position that's ahead of you. Then the conversation is not all on the interviewer side where they're saying, hmm, do you fit? It becomes a matter of saying, look, here's what I want to be able to do. Here's what I'm looking to accomplish. Here's the, the, here are the things that I have done in the past as it relates to what I think you need or what you want here. This is what I can do. This is what excites me. This is what, I'm a, what I'd like to be a part of. Again, appropriate to the situations and the interactions as they appear, and knowing some days you're just gonna you're gonna play the role of the okay, and that's fine. But if Tom Peters, also another wonderful uh, business guru, um, he's worth exploring. Tom Peters, in his work in search of excellence, um, you need a team of freaks. You need a team of freaks to do this thing, and to do it in such a way that that it really um, feed your, feed your, your soul, for lack of a better word, that, that energizes you. Um, that means that you won't need the 15 cups of coffee just to make it through lunch, um, you know, or, or whatever. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the challenges with remote, um, people who are clear on their function and purpose. Um, this is me just talking. I think that that, that's able to get through this resilience, right? To create the resilience in the different environments because the purpose continues. The environments change, the designs change, fine, we'll work, work our way through that. Um, but, you know, and in, in all of this, you've got in Northern Kentucky, incredible assets. And this is a great place to get connected to all those assets. You know, currently Gateway stands ready to help. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the career, you know, the Kentucky Career Center, um, you know, all of these assets that are available to you uh, with, with funding attached to some of it that can help. Um, you know, Gateway, we have our work ready scholarships for uh, degrees and certificates in the five key sectors. These are all things that are available to you. And I think that are much, will be a lot more fun to explore. And you'll be able to kick through a lot of brambles um, as you become more confident and aware of, um, of what you can do. Cause there, there are things that, in my, you know, I've heard this before and I think I stand by it. It's like, there are things you can do that none of us can do. And we need you, we need you in the work. So I stand with questions. Awesome, Dr. Figueroa, very inspirational. People are posting in the chat and making you think about what's your grail and what motivates you to come to work every day? I, I have to agree with you. It's like in COVID because we work remotely and we work in the building and you have email on your phone. Um, I get yelled at by my family all the time, like you're working. And I'm like, well, I love it. I love to help everybody and help people grow and move along in their jobs and you're doing exactly the same thing on a daily basis and making make it a difference in everybody's life. So we greatly appreciate it. We have a lot of people here today that are from Northern Kentucky. They're from Cincinnati. We have people from Columbus. We have people participating now from out of state who because their jobs went remote are interested in mo moving back to the area. So we have all kinds of questions out there. So um, if anyone has a question, I want you to feel free to either unmute and ask Dr. Figueroa a question, or if you're not comfortable with doing that, you're welcome to post it in the chat and I will ask it for you. So I got a question for you. So, mm -hmm. All right, so I've been a li librarian for 12 years now. But say, I don't know, say the state decided libraries aren't important, closed our funding, I lost my job, and I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. I'm going to a cocktail party, and I tell somebody, well, I just got my CDL license, so I can now, I'm not a long range truck driver, but I drive cars and I move things around and I get to listen to audiobooks on tape all the time now. So I'm really happy. Do you think 
other people would treat me differently because I moved from a quote unquote professional role to something that has traditionally been classified as non-professional. It's, it's something that bothers, bothers me because I grew up in a family. My mom was a secretary. My dad was a construction electrician. Yeah. When I first went to college, I was in school with all these other kids whose parents were like lawyers, doctors, white collar workers. And I kind of felt bad. But now I think things have changed. I think things have come full circle and that would be okay. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Well, what I tell folks is career and technical education is the new liberal arts. Um, you know, they, we, we used to think of as a separation from, and there's white collar and blue collar and all this stuff. And, and one, of the, one of the wonders about this moving from industrial, again, industrial puts everything in a peg, to the technological where it's like whatever ecosystem works, then, then we begin to understand that, that working, it, our automotive program, right? You could work for NASA after going through our automotive program. The, the electronics and the, the way the technology has changed, the software, your, your car uses a computer chip to move your tires in directions. Your steering wheel is not connected to your tires. It is, <laughs> I mean, when, when, my, when my dean told me that, I was like, okay, I get it. You know, the way that we, we, we look, it looks the same, but it's not. And so the, this notion of what is professional and what is not, that's what I'm saying that, that, that when the mythologies, getting into those mythologies, how were you defined? How did you come up? What are the things that, that, that you think brought you value or not value? You know, and, and, and understanding that usually the <laughs> I found the way life works is a thing. It takes the thing that you thought was going to give you value and it takes it away. <laughs> right. And then it's like, Okay, I don't have that anymore. What do I do now? And and it's um, and it, it and so the 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 journey. That's why I say it's it's really about the the new technology is mindfulness and getting into this idea that and it's really hard because we're brought up to to perform and get kudos for performing. But if you're if you're excited about and interested in CDO and driving and listening to books on tape and doing that performing of that and that lights you up then why would anybody take that away from you and how would you let anybody take that away from you um yeah I, good to it, know it's, That's, yeah sorry that's what i was thinking i was like you know you see people out there a lot of times and i'm always like you got to have a backup plan so right now there's a lot of people that need a backup plan because I know we have a lot of people in the group right now that were their titles were director of marketing or vice president of marketing. Yep. Those are some of the biggest jobs that people struggle with finding in our area right now. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people, if they have those titles, they're at that point in their career where they wouldn't necessarily be willing to move. They want to stay local, but they get trapped in that and they don't know how to move in a different direction. Do you ever see any people like that, that, that want to maybe do something different, like totally different, like maybe move into advanced manufacturing and get WIOA funding to do that? Maybe there was somebody that Yes, they were in marketing, but they're really good with their hands. Are they really like technical things? Yeah. Um, one individual that's very prominent in our region, so I'm not going to share his name, um, but, uh, you know, he's in finance and he confided in me. It's like, you know, I got into finance because it was a respectable thing to do. It was how I was kind of the professional thing, but he loves working with his hands and he's a brilliant carpenter. And, you know, so... You know, I don't know that I could have made a living with music, um, but there was a time I was seriously thinking about, <laughs> about it. And, and so, you know, your, your day job can be your day job. That's fine. And, and as long as you, you know, uh, like I told my son, Christopher, it's like he wanted to be a jazz musician. I said, OK, as long as you're realistic about it, as long as you are, in, you have your feet planted on the ground and you're seeing what's really in front of you rather than just, you know, all the, the, the aspirations. Right. Work and that dynamic is always part of the game. Um, backup plans. 
you know, in titles, it, it's like unpacking the title, right? Unpacking the title to what you're capable of doing. And I, I would highly recommend the idea of going to an entrepreneur, a workshop of some kind, or just an exercise that kind of lets you know your competencies are yours. They are not validated just because someone gives you a paycheck for it. And, and you know, and again, this, this, this is not Pollyanna. This is tough stuff. And, and there are gut checks along the way. But I would dare say that you're going to get through gut checks a lot better if you are clear that your competencies are yours and they are not awarded by someone saying, we'll pay you for them. Very true. Good. Any, anyone want to unmute and ask Dr. Figueroa a question? I'm just looking at the top of my screen. Dr. Figueroa, everyone is, comp is complimenting and posting in the chat about how inspirational and how wonderful everything was. Um, and how much you've helped them with their mindset. But I was hoping that some of them would ask some questions about your thoughts on where, what they could do next or where, what they might, where they might go on their current pass. Um, let me just- I have a question. Julie, yeah. Julie. Hi, hi, that was so wonderful, thank you. Um, I guess it's more of a statement, but I'm wondering if you could expand on something you said towards the end there. I really appreciated your comments on being authentic in the interview. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the gifts that, that the pandemic, you know, with time and also unemployment has given has been opportunity to really spend more time listening and thinking and, and you know, consuming things that that I'm passionate about. Um, and so I guess I'm just trying, I'm working through my thoughts on balancing, you know, following a, a guidebook for how I'm gonna get it exactly right versus bringing my true self to an interview and knowing that so long as I'm truthful to me, I've done my best. So is there anything more you can say on that or anybody else have thoughts on it? Well, um, my two cents is, um, you know, I, in my journey, um, I, I'm a middle child and I own that mythology. Um, and so being unseen, um, not being necessarily appreciated because I didn't have a role that was clearly defined like the eldest and the youngest. Um, and then going through my career where frankly, um, I had a lot of people scratching their heads about what the heck I was doing in the classroom. Um, I knew because I saw the results. Um, but you know, I I I went up for um, tenure twice and was rejected. And um, again, it was like okay, but I'm. <laughs> I remember the first one I got rejected. They came out pretty strong and said, "Yeah." Okay, someone said, "Well, what if you don't get this?" And it's like, you know what? I'm going to be a teacher no matter what. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what you say. I'm going to be a teacher. Um, I was young. I was a little more <laughs> aggressive, perhaps, than made it sense at the time. Um, but, but, but I think, again, it's, it's really one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is whatever decision you make, be one that you can live with, number one. And number two, there's no such thing as good decisions. There's only decisions that you make good. And so that navigation, right, and the, what what to understand the game, because it is a game. Every single one of these things is a game. Understanding the rules of the game. You're gonna play in the NFL, understand the rules. NBA, and you know, understand the rules. If you're gonna play in the Olympics, understand the rules. There are rules to the game, but within the game, like chess, there are endless possibilities of expression. And there are gambits that work and gambits that get set back. And if you're constantly in this learning process, you become a person of presence and not just a receptacle of a job, right? Because I think ultimately, if you're going to have become a linchpin of sorts in your organization, and Seth Godin is another one, G-O-D-I-N. Seth Godin is a wonderful person to read because, you know, the purple cow thing. If you understand you're the game and your authentic exploration and expression of your grail, then I think you've got the opportunities of developing a life that you can look back on and say, Yes. 
Whereas if it's, I got this job, I got this job, I got this job, I got this job, I got laid off, I got this job, you know, and all this other stuff. And you're searching for some sort of nirvana, like, you know, oh, when I become a president, everything will be fine. No, it won't be, right? And we know that because there, there are people that are making millions and billions of dollars that are committing suicide. People in wonderful jobs and work and movies and television and adored you know, except Alan Alda from MASH, many of you are old enough to remember Alan Alda from MASH in an interview said, you know, because Barbara Walter said, everybody loves you. It's like, no one knows me, Barbara. My wife knows me, my kids know me, nobody else knows me. That's frankly why he lived so long. George Clooney's another one. My God, he's like, hey, some people like me now, people are not gonna like me later. I'm working it and using it as best I can so that when people stop looking at me as an actor, then I'll be a producer, I'll be a I'll be making bourbon, I'll be, you know, making coffee, I'll be doing all this other stuff. That is available to all of us. And it ain't easy. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Um, Tom Jones had a question for you too. Tom. Good morning, Dr. Figueroa. Um, wonderful, I'm very excited about the, the opportunities you presented. Um, you talked a little bit about Daniel Pink and a whole new mind. Uh, uh, the conversation came up this morning that I'm, you know, pretty much, you know, not in my right mind, or I am in my right mind. Are there, are there, is there a practical approach or a tactical approach on how to leverage um, the things that make me unique and different, and you know, to, to be able to, to use that in the job search um, world? Okay, so. Remember I was saying career and technical education is a new liberal arts. What, you know, the Daniel Pink's and reading through that, there's some really interesting kind of specifics and resources that you can explore to kind of get a feel for what competencies you bring to the table. But no matter what job there is, there is always a need for clear communication, right? And effective communication. Now that's defined by the individual and the constantly mulling over, how am I messaging? And frankly, if you're putting more than three sentences in a email, you are, you better get on the phone. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's number one. The second is the ability to reason, to size up a situation, to look at the ecosystem and to see it. And again, this is left brain and right brain working together. You got to see the individual parts, but you also have to understand the relationship of those parts and how they work together. And being a sense of an engineer, right? This is what an engineer does, is it looks at an ecosystem and then she will take this and look at, okay, where's the efficiency models and the competency models that, that are related to that, to that overall design. Being able to see big picture and little picture, microscopic and macroscopic at the same time are gonna be critical skills no matter what you do. Uh, software programming. You know, programming is all about putting together steps in order of operation in a dependable fashion. Well, that's what management is. The problem with management is you're dealing with people, which means that you gotta herd cats. And herding cats is not really a problem if you got food. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Um, we'll let you take a drink of water, but um, Nancy Kanoff has a question for you as well. So Nancy. Hi, Dr. Figuera. Figuera. <laughs> Sorry if I said that incorrectly. Not I work, a problem, Nancy. I work for the Kenton County Library as a career change navigator, and we, we meet all sorts of different people in different stages of career transition. And I was curious how you would advise someone who's been out of the workforce for a very long time. They've been on a hiatus for whatever, you know, personal reasons. And so it's sort of intimidating to come, you know, into the workforce and be looking for a job now. Do you have any advice for them? Well, you know, the What Color Is Your Parachute, um, there's a section about uh, looking beyond jobs as a way of describing that you can do another job and really thinking about you know, like being a grandparent. If you're a stay-at-home grandparent with kids, you got a lot of skills. You've got a lot of management skills. You've got a lot of interpersonal skills. You, you've got ability to size up situations and work with emergency communication sometimes. You know, it's, it's being able, again, to unpack this notion of what work is we have spent so much time thinking of the job as the goal and the job is not the goal. The job is the expression. The job is the tool. We are the goal and being able to look at, and, and if nothing else, it just builds confidence that you're not walking into a situation. My wife, my wife um, 
you know, uh, does not have a college diploma. Uh, she graduated high school, got married, had several kids, got divorced, and then 25 years in highway and bridge design and rode that career out. Um, and, and, you know, her first time in a college classroom in 25 years was when we moved to Tyler, Texas, and I was working at, at uh, Tyler Junior College, and she was in a classroom with a bunch of 18 year olds. And fortunately, her teacher, Nomi, uh, really understood that dynamic and understood that she worked with a community college. And my wife, who was so terribly intimidated going, what am I gonna talk about with these kids? And how is this gonna interact? And she suddenly realized how much, or didn't suddenly, but over time came to realize that not having the college diploma was not the thing. I could talk to her all day long about it. She's published many times over, pub, you know, essays, <laughs> and poems. She's put together community art galleries that have never existed before. And yet she had this mindset, this mythology that said, if I don't have a college diploma somehow, or if I'm, you know, 40 something or 50 something in a room full of 18 year olds, then I'm irrelevant. And it coming back to the mindset of, oh, I have a lot to offer. That seems to me to be the first step. And then it's being smart about the game. Right. Which are the games in play that match up with my skills and abilities? And frankly, if that's not available at this point, then what's your game to get your, you know, your money, right? To get your lifestyle to, to a stable level and then build from there. Because frankly, no matter what job you're at, the best time to look for a job is when you have a job. Thank you. Very true. Any other questions for Dr. Figueroa? Let them out there. I'm going to go back to the beginning because there were a couple right at the beginning and I think I missed a few of them there. So I just wanted to go back to the credential question you brought up at the very beginning, um, Dr. Figueroa, that a lot of people get trapped in their prior credentials and what they've done, whether it's you know an MBA, whether they were an attorney, um, whether they have CPA after their name, and they're at a certain salary level, and they get nervous about, will someone accept me if I change professors and do something diff different? Right. How would you counsel someone about kind of leaving their prior credentials at the door knowing that no knowledge is ever wasted and building kind of a new personality or a new life as you will, as you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, with mindfulness, it's about excavating, right? Excavating your life, excavating your experiences, um, your credentials, things that you've done. Um, you know, my older son, uh, who is in software right now, but he's not really thrilled about it, uh, but he's an Eagle Scout. And um, one of the things about my son, Christian, being an Eagle Scout is his ability to identify, it's like going through that project, right? And people kind of take it as, you know, you show them the car and it's like, oh, Eagle Scout, get it. Um, but sometimes it takes some unpacking and the credential, if you get lost and you say, okay, I'm that card, then the minute someone says that card doesn't matter, you're done, right? And so, yes, I, I think, and, and unfortunately, Graduate students get really lost in this. I've, you know, and, and there's been a lot of lamentation in the university world about adjuncts, right? Part-time, and, and unfortunately, the economic model of universities and colleges has depended heavily on part-time instructors. Um, there's a place for that, but I think it's over leveraged in terms of, you know, talent. But where, you know, I, I've, I've written about this in other places, um, for, for a person with a PhD uh, to, to feel trapped, um, that's a problem for me. That means that there's something in the educational system that we, we, again, look at the back of the book for the answer. And the credential is that thing. If I get this credential and it's going to open all these jobs, it's like, no, credential didn't do nothing in terms of actually activating. Now, if you're an apprenticeship model, that's different, but then that's a pre-interview process and you're getting experience in the workplace at the same time. But if you've got your title and you're working on your title, then, then you know what? I would do an exercise of taking your title, writing it on something and flushing it down the toilet just for the heck of it, just to see what it feels like. And then, okay, so it's no longer the title. I don't have a doctor in front of my name. I don't have a PhD behind my name. I don't have an MBA. Um, I can't say that I worked at, you know, 
uh, Macy's or Kroger or, or some other, you know, as a, a general manager. Okay, so I'm just Fernando Figueroa. All right, what's Fernando Figueroa care about? What can Fernando Figueroa do? And then what are the resources? And that's the beautiful thing about a group like this is that you've got the line. All you have to do is ask the question and you will find the resources. And if you got it, what's inside of you. And frankly, if you've been uh, de-jobbed at a certain level, I think there's a burn in you. There was a burn in me. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, uh -uh, they ain't going to have it again. And it did. <laughs> but, but you, you know, but again, it's that, that sense of you got to be kicked on your heel sometimes to be able to say, okay, so what does matter? What is real? What is it that regardless of what happens, it's like, take away all this other stuff. It's like, but this is it. That's what you walk into a room. And frankly, you know, people will hire you and they will put you in an office and it will be like, okay, you're doing your thing. And until something or someone else can do it better or cheaper, you get to do that thing. But when someone can do it or something can do it cheaper and faster and better, then they don't need that thing anymore. They don't need you anymore. So that's, that's the game, that's the game. And so the question is how do we as people kind of work the game and understand that, you know, not all of us are gonna be able to, uh, well, we can all be the, the best version of ourselves. That sounds trite, I know, but, but it, it, if, you, if you're really into it, if you're really into this idea of understanding what you are and who you are and what you can create and frankly, how you can change the world for a better place the way that you see it, then it becomes, there's an energy about you that speaks beyond any credential. And frankly, I know a lot of people that are credentialed that I wouldn't, I would never hire them. Very interesting. Good. Dr. Figueroa. We will ask one favor of you uh, with your work in the community and your work on the investment board, we'll ask that as you're working with all the CEOs of all the organizations that I know you're connected with in our area and Cincinnati and so forth, that you keep encouraging employers to think, to think outside of the box. Because the biggest thing that we're seeing with people that are you know, older, especially 50, 51, 52, that, that's young now. I mean, yeah. my mom's 82. She still works three days a week. So that's young. That people will be willing to understand that people have learned a lot. They've shown they can learn and they can learn their business too. That they have the transferable stills that they could take from healthcare and use it in IT or vice versa and that they're more open and more amendable to um, not always having experience in their specific industry. We find that that is a big problem today, so. Agreed, and, and I do think that is a conversation uh, that we're having in terms of job quality and being able to identify what are the competencies, right? Not job descriptions, but competencies. Competencies, that's great. Okay, someone jumped in that I think wanted to say something. Dave, are you out there? I'll give him a second. I am to here. He's here. Hey! My fearless leader. Hello, uh -oh. everyone. <laughs> I'm Dave Schrader, director of the library. So if you've uh, been on these a few times, you see me pop in. I uh, just wanted to pop in and say thanks to Dr. Figueroa for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your involvement in the community. He's, he works on the web with me, so we see each other more frequently when, than we used to anyway. But um, Kenton County Library and Gateway have had a long connection. Well over a decade ago, we signed a, a memorandum of agreement where we would um, provide library services um, on a certain level to Gateway um, because it made no sense to recreate an entire library when, you know, we, were, we have libraries in the community already and Gateway was very innovative in that regard. And um, it's worked out really well and it's been great for us to work with the students and the faculty. And I hope the students and faculty have enjoyed working with our staff as well. So um, uh, Gateway and KCPL have been connected uh, since the very beginning. I can remember Dr. Hughes coming in before Gateway had a name. Yep. And he was 
and he was directed to me. I was the local history librarian and he, he wanted to know what famous people came out of Northern Kentucky. And so I started throwing him names and I said, how about the George Clooney uh, community? <laughs> in I said, you know, it's got name recognition, but he didn't go for it. Uh, I think Gateway was a much better choice. But, uh, yeah, and chosen by the community, by the way. Yes, yes. So um, we're, we're very fortunate to have leaders like Dr. Figueroa coming to our, our meetings and sharing their experiences and their journeys because I, I you know, picked up a little bit of the end of his talk. And you know, we all have a different journey and we've all made our way through this life. And the great thing about the accountability group, I think is you're all learning from each other. Yeah. And so um, that's the key, you know, the more we learn from each other, the better off we are. So thank you to Dr. Figueroa for being here today. And as always, I wanna thank Natalie and our staff and our volunteers, they do a great job. Uh, we're very appreciative of all they do for us. And uh, I wish you all a, um, a happy holiday weekend. So um, keep on trugging along and keep on using the library. And thank you, Dave. Thank you again, Dr. <laughs> Figueroa, for being here. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thanks again, Dr. Figueroa. I know you're really busy, guys, so I didn't want to keep you any longer. Hey, are we all, I just have to shout out for all the great book recommendations. We put them all in the chat and we have all the books. So thank Wonderful. you again. Um, and our best to you with your dad. We're thank sorry you. to hear that. No, it'll be a tough time for you and your family. Mm -hmm. So um, he had we'll a good run, he had a okay. very good run. Good. Well, we'll keep him and you and your family in our prayers too. So thanks, Dave. Um, we'll appreciate, we appreciate both of you being here. Um, before I let everybody else go, I just have a couple things I needed to share with um, the rest of you. Um, next week, uh, executive coach Maria Reynolds is going to be with us and she is going to follow up on Dr. Figueroa's talk today, his inspiring talk, and talk about creating a vision board for your future that meets both your career goals and your personal goals within your life and how you can do that and how you can start tying in some of what the inspiration that Dr. Figueroa expressed today and how you can consider that long term as you plan for your future. A lot of times we're all so busy in our day-to-day -day lives and we don't, we're not really sure what grail we're working towards as Dr. Figueroa said. And then all of a sudden we lose our job and we have this time to reflect. So we want you to take the time to really do some inner study and some reflection and figure out what it really is that's gonna make you happy, where you wanna go and think about that long-term and whether or not maybe those credentials you have or that last job title you had could be holding you back from stepping through another door. So Maria Reynolds will be talking about that next week. And some of the other things I wanted to mention, by the way, um, most of you know that I've been teaching our professional level uh, resume workshop for about four years now. And I feel like I needed to take a break and Maria is going to be taking over teaching that. We're going to co-teach it on Monday at 1.30 together. So just, just an FYI on, on that one. Um, tomorrow morning, Pam Baker on our team is going to do an introduction to online learning class with KCPL. She's going to talk all about how you can get enrolled in Gale courses, our 24-hour credit classes that you can take to grow, expand your skills, explore new potential occupations. They're each 24 hours long. If you were gonna take a class like that, I think up at UC and their adult ed, it might cost you $115. You can take it for free with us. She's also gonna teach you how to use Learning Express. If you wanna power through any types of software classes to get ready for interviews, for other jobs, you can do that too. So that's tomorrow morning at 10. And then um, the other two classes that I didn't mention yet, because I was kind of holding off until after Dr. Figueroa's talk. Next week on Thursday, Dr. Angie Taylor is teaching our transferable skills workshop. And Angie worked at Gateway for over 20 years as their vice president of workforce and helped many, many people transition. 
and she's a wonderful career and executive coach herself. So we asked her to teach that class to help people figure out what are those skills that you have that could transfer into another job or a different industry. So that is on Thursday morning. And then on Friday, Dr. Laura Cantor, who is a positive performance psychologist and an organizational leader at St. Elizabeth's is going to talk about exploring your strengths for our VO Strengths class. So the two classes are back to back, one on skills, one on strengths. For Dr. Laura's class on Friday, you can't wait till the last minute to register because she requires you to complete a survey that's gonna take you about 15 minutes and cause you to think about yourself so that she can review that and then give you some guidance during that workshop next Friday. So those are things that we have coming up. I'm going to let everybody go. We will start the Northern Kentucky Roundtable promptly at 11 o'clock. So you get a break, your drink of water. Happy Easter, great holidays to everyone. Thanks again, Dr. Figueroa, and thanks, Dave. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. And by the way, you can save the chat if you'd like by clicking the last, the three little dots in the bottom of the chat at the end before the meeting ends. So thanks, everybody.